everyone. Welcome to The Safe House, brought to you by The Safe House Initiative. I'm Jeff Edwards, co-chair of The Safe House Initiative and your host for today's podcast. Many small and mid-sized businesses don't have a CISO, yet have all the requirements of one. What do they do? Our guest today is going to shed light on this particular challenge. Craig Schaefer is an expert in this arena and literally, I mean literally, wrote the book on information security for small and mid-sized businesses. Greg is a principal at VCSO Services and is our guest today. Welcome, Greg. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we're glad to have you. Hey, uh, point yourself with our audience guy and give them, uh, you know, kind of how you got to be where you are today and kind of your, your journey. Well, I've been doing this IT and information security stuff for 35 years now. I started as a part-time student assistant uh, at the University of Buffalo. I was a mechanical engineering undergrad. Thought that working in this networking stuff would be kind of cool, better than working at Burger King. Nothing against Burger King, but it was just a better environment. Came to realize that I really enjoyed this networking. This was before Twisted Pair Ethernet, and and a lot of our networking was actually uh, serial point to point and not mm. ethernet and uh so mm. i've seen the technologies grow throughout the last 35 years and kind of grew up in networking network uh administrator network engineer director of network services those were titles that i had along the way and in the process of all that um realized that at one point in time in my career that I was spending more time trying to block folks than I was trying to get them to connect. So the first part of the career was all about, yay, we can get these people to connect. And the second part was, well, maybe I don't want people to connect. And that first started with um, a lot of the music sharing. Uh, at the time mm -hmm. of my career, I was working for a university, uh, Middle Tennessee State, and Napster had come out. And Napster was a bandwidth hog. It sucked the mm -hmm. bandwidth. We didn't have unlimited bandwidth. I think we had... And at the time, I think we had five T ones. So if you do the multiplication there, that's <laughs> seven and a half megabits mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. data. So the security aspect was born of necessity. I needed to get the network mm -hmm. under control. Well, Middle Tennessee State didn't have a security officer that fell on me by de facto. I realized that I really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed the risk management aspect of it the most, which was mm -hmm. odd because of the technical background I had, and uh, then eventually uh, left to become uh, the first CISO of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, and then did a did several years as CISO for an, a community bank, and then uh, ended up going out on my own. And the reason why I did that is because I saw a need for small and mid-sized businesses. They didn't have access to the um, experience and knowledge that full-time CISOs like myself possess. It was also a bit of a God nudge as well, too, that, hey, Greg, you're doing well with your talents, but I think you could be doing better. And so my response was yes. And yeah. I've, I've been doing the virtual CISO thing now for seven years, actually. So let me ask you a quick question. Have you you've seen the role of the CISO evolve over the, you know, your tenure? Can you kind of describe what that looked like? Because it sound like you you said something about risk management in there. And most people define as information security and risk management seems to be a much bigger discussion. Could you expound upon that? I think the, the CISO originally started out as uh, information security risk management with Steve Katz. He was uh, uh, in uh, mm -hmm. he heavy in the risk management side, but it did tend to seem to be more of a technical point because mm -hmm. as I was mentioning, the most people, when they think about information security, they think the technical side, because again, the technical controls, firewalls and all those things. And, and so I like to distinguish, right. it's probably better to get this out of the way sooner than later. I like to distinguish the difference between information security and cybersecurity. Yeah. Cybersecurity is the technical subset of information security in my, okay. in my view. Okay. Then, then IT security is part of cybersecurity. Governance, risk, and compliance is part of information security. Certainly, when you have uh, uh, some of the um, 
red teaming, blue teaming that falls underneath cybersecurity as well, too. So you got you got mm -hmm. governance, you got policy, you got risk management. So this gets back to your question about the type of CISO. Most CISOs are going to be technical, but some come up from the administrative side because really a, a, a CISO is a blend of both. They have to be um, proficient and fluent in business speak, so to speak, and they have to have mm -hmm. the technical acumen. They have to be able to translate. I've seen over the course of the last couple of decades a proliferation of different types of CISOs. I think some there have been some that really don't I don't I don't know if I want to use the word deserve the title, but I don't think they're terribly effective because they're the type of where they'll go to a position. You know, a CISO's tenure is like 18 to 24 months is a yeah. kind of a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. And that's not enough time to really establish yourself and your legacy. You get there, you see what's going on, you unspool it, then you figure out a risk, you figure out a tool or a couple of tools to fix that risk. You spend the time and the money implementing that tool. And by the time that the tool is not necessarily promising the ROI that was expected, then the CISO moves on to a higher paying gig. And mm -hmm. and so you see a lot of CISOs that have gone through this progression, and yet they've never really, I think, effectively practiced their trade to completion. And that's part of the reason, certainly not all of it, that's part of the reasons why I say that there are a lot of CISOs out there that would make absolutely horrible virtual CISOs. Why is that, Greg? The virtual CISO field is, there's some commonalities to the chief information security officer just by name. A virtual CISO in, generally is going to be someone who uh, has significant information security risk management experience, preferably has been a CISO beforehand, yeah. um, an effective one, uh, but they but they practice their trade for small and mid-sized businesses. But that's where it begins to diverge because those wash, rinse, and repeat CISOs, the yeah. ones that that don't stick around more than a couple of years, they typically they 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 know the larger corporation game, if you will. They so so they understand. Okay, I I do this stuff. I I can I can implement or try to implement these controls and I move on. But a small business, the culture is completely different, and mm -hmm. and and so you have to approach it again from a risk management standpoint. The risks are going to be different, not the cyber and the information security risks, but the business risks are going to be different. And if you get in a full-time CISO from a bigger organization to try to do that for a small organization, it a lot of times it doesn't work. They, they want to solve problems by throwing money at it, and small businesses right. just don't have that. So that that's one of the that's one of the reasons why I say that. In a small mid-sized business and the virtual CISO, you become more like a uh, part of the board of directors or do you become more of the management team on an operational basis i, I guess that would be it right maybe more of an operational ceo slash cso slash cfo kind of a round table sort of the the other aspect is to to why sometimes uh it's difficult for people to transition from full-time to part-time is because you're you're actually a consultant you're you're, you're not right. Even if you have the C, if you will, in your name, and and talking about the C and CISOs, if if you don't report to the CEO or the board, you're chief of nothing. It's it's just a C that means nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's that's sort of the nomenclature that we fell into in the last 20, 25 years. Yeah. But with a consultant, you're not an officer of the company. You right. likely report to one. You can't affect change so much as you can recommend change. So then the affecting of the change, the implementation of it, that's where the recommendation comes in. And, and the, C, the virtual CISO will say, for example, well, for where you want to be from your maturity and, and your risk posture, you probably want to make sure that you have multi-factor on your Office 365 account. That's a basic one. Everybody should have that in place. Mm -hmm. But you're not tasked or responsible for ensuring that that happens. That, that's something that mm -hmm. the company has to do because we typically, as virtual CISOs, we don't request nor need to have right access to any systems. We're second line of defense. So the first line being operational, IT security management, the second line yeah. being risk management, the third line being audit. We're second line. So we don't want to have access to any right. of that, that stuff. Mm -hmm. But we better be very, very, very good at risk management to be able to make informed risk recommendations so that 
Conversely, the business can make informed risk decisions. So where do you begin when you have a new client, for instance, and uh, what, does a new, what do your new clients look like? Just curious. A typical new client, at least for us, the size is going to be anywhere between, we've had some businesses that have been small as four people. Okay. And up to when we do advisory CISO services, they had 10,000. So, hmm. uh, but, but typically the SMB space is going to be somewhere between like 20 and 200, give or take full-time employees. The first thing that we do uh, at VCSO services, we want to try to figure out their why. The why is very important. Mm. Why, why did you contact us? And there's two reasons why we want to do that. The first is obvious that we want to be sure that we're fulfilling what it is that you're asking for. And that's really typical of any consulting gig, no matter what industry mm -hmm. vertical you're in. You you, mm -hmm. you want to be able to make sure you can provide the service that they're asking for. But the second for us is we build information security programs. We don't just enable compliance. And what I mean by that is that real world example of somebody coming to us and saying, well, we've got customers that tell us we need a SOC 2. We want to become compliant with SOC 2. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what does that mean? That I mean, do you want to build an information security program? No, we just want to do what we need to do to get to the SOC 2 because we got to get this business. Well, um, my firm will politely decline that because yeah. our charge is to build information security programs. So that's where the beginning is. And then once we get over that, I don't want to call it hurdle, but once we clear that to make sure that we're we're meeting each other's expectations, yeah, then we start to do the intake process. And this is going to be asking them a lot of questions, looking at some evidence. Um, we use, depending upon the size and the nature, there's a couple of intake methods and tools that we use, uh, whether it be a, a GRC or what I call a GRC light or more of a compliance uh, framework matching tool that we have several at our disposal that we will leverage just based on the need. And then from there, really what we're focused on is, and I think all virtual CISOs are or should be focused on, is determining what the risks are right now and then start to build out a risk register and start to address those risks. So that's how mm -hmm. a typical client engagement begins. Are there common things that you see, you know, when you when you bring on the new clients? Are there like top three things you see things just pop out right away? That's a good question. They tell us in Toastmasters never to say that's a good question. It's sort of a stall <laughs> tactic. <laughs> but that's part of the reason uh, why I authored Information Security for Small and Mid-Sized Businesses. The genesis of that was that we were getting... Um, me in particular was, we would get common questions when we first start engaging with businesses. And some of those questions would be, well, what is a SOC 2? What is a business continuity tabletop exercise? Why is it important to have independence in a firewall rule review? Those are sort of like common things where they don't really, they don't understand the three line of defense model that I briefly mentioned before. And that's usually one of the places where I start to try to explain to them the the holistic overview of what it is we're trying to do. And so the mm -hmm. book is really a compilation of a lot of those things that over over the last seven years that I found that are common common questions for small and mid-sized businesses. And 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 you don't want to answer it like, well, that's because the framework requires it, or that's because that's best practice. You want to answer it in terms of what's important to them. This is one of the examples of like where they might like not be sure as to the why. One of the stories I love to tell, and it's rather ironic because today, as we're recording this a couple hours ago, I actually did a tabletop exercise with the same organization that I'm about to tell the story about. This one organization, there were a couple that were kind of resistant back in 2018 to doing the tabletop. They didn't really see the value in it. Mm. We mm. script a, a different scenario every year to make it interesting. Well, in 2018, we scripted a pandemic. And the reaction was, you know, this is just a check the box thing. You say you don't do check the box, we're never going to have a pandemic. Well, and of course, we know what happened. Those folks that had gone through that tabletop were actually a lot better prepared once COVID hit. And so I use uh, that story and other stories of experience to explain to businesses why 
what we do is important in their eyes beyond just like the information security and checking the box. Because ultimately, whether you're a CISO or a virtual CISO, you're a salesperson and you're trying yeah. to sell to the C-suite and the board of directors why what you do is important. And yeah. if you can speak their language and show benefits to the business, then you're going to be a lot more successful. So what is your role in a, uh, let's say, a ransomware type of an event? Are you then operational or still more of a in the skybox uh, calling in plays? <laughs> I like the football <laughs> analogy. I guess it could go for for a lot uh, different sports there. But uh, typically, <laughs> typically with a virtual CISO, so, so, so incident response, okay? Incident response is a sub-discipline of itself yeah. that requires yeah. a lot of very specific experience and skill sets with regards to doing things right, both both hunting and and forensics, but also it involves like SLAs that that are very difficult to keep. You have to be able to respond within a couple of hours, like at 24 hours a day. Yeah. T typically, uh, because of that, most virtual CISOs will at least as far as I understand, certainly this is the case with us. So maybe I should just speak for us is, is that we don't offer boots on the ground incident management for that reason. We help prepare mm -hmm. for when it happens. Mm -hmm. We yep. help with the postmortem and yep. we will assist the experts as we can when an incident happens. And if you think about it, if you're a CISO full-time at an organization, you're not going to be in the trenches trying to like, you know, do packet traces and look at logs yeah. and all that. You've got people that are there that are yeah. the experts to do that. It's the same yeah. thing with the virtual CISO. You don't yeah. want to get in the middle of the people that really, really know what they're doing because we're more high level. We're more, again, risk attuned and all that. Let them do their process. Make sure that they're following the right processes. You definitely want to make sure that uh, you're following chain of ed custody of evidence, for example. But but get out of their way. Let them do their job. Manage the process from beginning to end, though. Yeah, so you probably help them, uh, your clients, say, hey, you really should, uh, if an event happens, you probably should have your uh, attorneys or someone who can help you negotiate. You probably need to have an incident response company. You need to have these things thought through. Is mm -hmm. that what I'm hearing? Yeah, the, you want to have you want to make sure you have an incident response plan that you update every year. Make sure that yeah. it not only has your your processes, maybe some playbooks for different scenarios in there, depending upon your your vertical and your threats. Contact lists of uh, partners that you need to call. And and for some folks that we work with, we partner with another organization that we we will white either white label or or refer a uh, incident response organization they, again that they do this so we have that partnership going on and yeah. and we just make sure that they have that relationship established beforehand yeah and, and i think that you know if we can go back circle back to what you said earlier about information security uh that cyber is a subset thereof mm -hmm. and everybody gets so wrapped around the cyber portion they forget about the broader picture and you're talking about you know business uh continuation uh, um, exercises, things of that nature. So you have a much broader view of the world, right? Right. I mean, uh, so a couple of examples just right off the top. You, know, you got policies. Policies aren't necessarily cyber. Cyber involves like protecting uh, information technology information. So uh, that that sort of data that is that is in bits and bytes, that's almost that's by definition. Um, but policies are more about how you do things. So acceptable use, how you use that stuff. And it's not just necessarily how do you use the technology? It's also how do you use the information, information classification policy and handling yeah. policy? How do you classify and handle your information? And then there's also the physical aspect, because I I'm still a dinosaur. I use paper and a lot of people do. And paper's not going to mm -hmm. go away. It's the it's the original uh, printer and, uh, you know, it's very flexible and, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about loading different fonts. It's just to use your handwriting and paper needs to be secured. Offices need to be secured. So physical security is a component of information security or maybe vice versa. They overlap. Mm -hmm. So to say that something is just purely cyber, one of the reasons why this is a problem for me and why I push back when people say, well, what's the difference? Uh, you know, I say cyber, you say information. It's the same thing. 
it's not because when you say cyber, you are giving people the impression that yeah. cyber is just simply about technology and not yeah. about anything else. And yeah. and that's bad. There's then you throw it on IT shoulder and it's all about them and it's it ends up not being correct. So the virtual CISO, did you kind of pave the way for the virtual CISO or uh, did it evolve and uh, grow out of some other natural method or did you really create this whole new uh, type of marketplace? Oh, I, I'd love to take credit, but I can't. Now, yeah. now, the virtual CISO had been around for a while. Like I'll give an example, uh, FR Secure. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they had been doing virtual CISO work since I think 2006 or 2007, something like that. So it, it was a discipline beforehand, but, but a couple of the things that were different back then as opposed to now is that First of all, what I mentioned as far as there being like the, the virtual CISOs were mainly folks that were previous CISOs uh, and were doing it now part time with several clients. And second of all, there wasn't as much demand then. People didn't really know about it. Now, when I started in 2017, it was still pretty much that same ecostructure, ecosystem, yeah. if you will. People didn't know that much about the virtual CISO. They were trying to, they were starting to hear about it. They, they, they hear about it from their insurance carrier. They hear about it from vendors. But most of the virtual CISOs were like me. We had been virtual, we had been CISOs and we were now practicing our craft. Instead of being under one employer, we had four clients or five clients or something like that. What has transpired since then has been a real disservice to the small and mid-sized businesses, in my opinion, because what's happened is the virtual CISO field has become very lucrative and for good reason. I mean, a full-time CISO is going to pull in on average about $300,000 a year in, in, in salary and compensation in the United States. It depends upon size of business, but I mean, small business can't do that. But but the experience is still worth that money. But you've got people that have decided to put the virtual CISO moniker on their LinkedIn page, for example, mm -hmm. with maybe three years of experience as an IT security analyst. And the small and mid-sized business doesn't know the difference. So they don't know what they're getting. And yeah. this is this has become a real, real problem in the field. And and we've come along behind virtual CISOs who really should not have been and had yeah. to fix some of the problems because quite honestly, a virtual CISO who doesn't know what they're doing can cause more damage than if the company hadn't brought in anybody at all. What kind of damage? Can you kind of uh, get into that for a second? Just curious, you know, you have some more stories. Well, bad advice or bad um, conclusions. I I'll give you one more story. One group that we started with, uh, their virtual CISO, they kind of like went, uh, they did some other stuff with the virtual CISO stuff. And and they uh, one of the things they did was penetration testing. Usually uh -huh. that's a separate discipline, but this virtual CISO provided penetration tests. And hmm. the new client was was all happy when I asked for their latest penetration test from a year ago. You know, it was, they didn't find anything. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem why they didn't find anything is that when you do a penetration test, it's supposed to be, you start with a vulnerability assessment, you then look at vulnerabilities that you can exploit, and then you go through uh, manually and try to exploit some of those vulnerabilities. So part automatic, part person usually, right? Well, yeah. they used a product called um, Greenbone. Uh, it's an open VOS. And they did a vulnerability scan that didn't pick up any vulnerabilities. And the reason why it didn't pick up any vulnerabilities is because they misconfigured it. However, when they presented the report to their client, they said that they ran this, they, that their test lasted three or four days. Um, they, they're mm -hmm. happy to report that there were no vulnerabilities that they were able to exploit. It was garbage. But the company here, they thought, oh, we don't have any issues. So we come in, we do a pro bono, let's see what your network really looks like internal scan. And it no. was horrific what we found. That's what I'm talking about. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. So how do we go about, you know, I'm, I own a small business for instance, and uh, how would I go about finding a virtual CISO? Cause I have the need. How do I go about that? Th there's not like a central clearing house, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. At some point in time, you're probably going to see that, but you can do a search on for virtual CISOs. Mm -hmm. Finding one is really not the problem. Finding one that's that's proper, that has the experience is. Now, I mentioned beforehand um, that 
the, the problem of some virtual CISOs out there, they don't have the experience, but there still is this real demand. And there's not enough of us who decided to mm -hmm. go from full-time to part-time. So there's the, there was that gap. One of the solutions to this, uh, I'm going to get back to um, kind of related to FR Secure, the, the CEO of that, Evan Francine, he also a CEO of a, of a company called Security Studio. They came up with a virtual CISO certification program, mm -hmm. uh, which which I recently went through to vet it. And I, I was I was very much impressed with what they're doing. And what and what Francine's trying to do is he's trying to solve that problem of there not being enough qualified virtual CISOs out there. Uh, yeah. So I think that one of the things to look for is either it, their certification, it isn't as if you go through this course for, for 10 weeks, six hours a week, and then suddenly you can practice. It's, there's also a um, measure of uh, apprenticeship that needs to be done, if you will. Mm. So okay. they're, they're doing it the right way. So I always implore folks that when you're looking for a virtual CISO, look for two things. Make sure you vet them, look at their resume, ask the service that, that, they're, that, that you're going to be getting from. What is their experience? What is the qualifications? And if they don't have either there, if they haven't been an information security risk management executive for a significant period of time, mm -hmm. or or they don't have this certification, then you might want to think twice because you might not be getting what you think you're getting. One of these days, maybe there will be like a, a virtual CISO clearinghouse, if you will. There has been talk of like trying to create something like I uh, started something called the virtual CISO exchange on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, which that was part of the idea that businesses could go there and look for a virtual CISO, but it really never took off. It's the group's been there for six years and minimal traffic, but maybe one of these days that'll be the solution. That sounds like a really exciting uh, environment that you're involved in. Every week is different. I'll say that. Um, and, and that's kind of, that's one of the things that keeps me going. I, I I'm, I'm blessed to be in a point in my life where I don't have to do this anymore, um, mm -hmm. but I I really enjoy it. I enjoy bringing people on staff and mentoring them. Again, part of the, the CVCSO program as well, too. I, if I can bring on a CVCSO and help mentor them as part of the apprenticeship program, then that helps the industry all, all around. So um, even though I don't have to do this, I want to do it. And, and I'm not ready to go out to pasture yet. I'm not quite there. <laughs> so. Well, I, I feel very much the same way, Greg. And I really enjoyed getting to know you a bit. And, uh, you know, like mine, you know, I'm trying to give back something at this part of our careers. That, you know, we've been blessed enough to be able to uh, to be able to do it. And, Absolutely. Uh, and you have the inclination to do it. And I, and I you know, uh, tip of the hat to you. So. Any other final thoughts before I ask you of my closing question about, you know, the one thing, but any final thoughts, uh, suggestions? In in our field, in, in, in information security, I partially for some of the reasons I mentioned, but just in general, we, we've done a very poor job of uh, paying attention to the SMB side. The SMB side, mm -hmm. SMBs make up 99.9% .9 of the businesses in the United States or 45% of employees. Mm -hmm. They're a significant part of the supply chain. You ever notice that when you have like a big breach that, that started with one of those SMBs, where does the blame always fall? I'll give you an example. Earlier this year, Bank of America, well, one of their small downstream suppliers was was breached and then that was used to jump into bank of america well mm -hmm. they blame bank of america's third party risk management they don't even look at well what could we do to help the posture of the small business that's where our mm -hmm. industry is failing miserably and so yeah. that's really my charge in life that's part of the reason for the book and for the podcast the um the virtual CISO moment and the um all the other stuff that i, I try to get out there and i'm trying to at least influence the industry in just a little manner to like, hey, we need to really take care of these folks as well, too. And, there, and I'll be honest, the reason why we don't is because the, the money is with the big folks. And yeah. you go to a conference, all the vendors there, for the most part, their solutions are geared towards larger organizations mm -hmm. or MSPs, which are basically, you know, yeah. They do help, but there's some profit involved there. And all the presentations, for the most part, are geared towards solutions that are geared more towards the larger organizations. So I guess 
you asked me about one more thing. You gave me an opportunity to step up my soapbox, so I did. So I'll jump off of it now. No, 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 no. <laughs> hey, no, because I, you know, I, I'm with you on this one. The third, you know, the the small mid sized businesses are an integral part of the supply chain, and which makes them the weakest link in it because they're the ones mm -hmm. that are most vulnerable traditionally and have the least uh, protections. Absolutely, and that's why we need we need to be focusing on them. It's not about getting these great new tools. I mean, everything's AI now, right? But it's, it's, it's not about getting these great new tools to, for the big organizations to threat hunt and have these socks with like monitors all over the place and this and that. Let's get back to the basics and talk about mm -hmm. the other folks. Because yeah. you're never going to have an SMB that's going to have those tools or those monitors all over the yeah. place. But they are a huge threat, not only to the large organizations, but just in general to, to, to the ecosystem. Well, and that's why I was so excited to have you on the uh, on the Safe House, uh, and you know, because the Safe House initiative is really geared to uh, help educate and to try to bring up the level of uh, you know resilience and uh, and security for small mid sized businesses uh, traditionally because they don't have they're under resourced and uh, and exposed. Right, and I appreciate all that you that you all do for that. I uh, appreciate that. Hey. You know, we always ask our guests if they had, you know, if they had one word of advice our uh, audience could go and do today, what would that one thing be, Greg? Breathe. Ah. Just breathe. If something is happening, don't get that visceral adrenaline reaction to have to do something. I think that traditionally we we also can cause more damage by thinking we have to re we have to be doing something right now to react to a threat out there as opposed to wondering what's the best approach and 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 unfortunately mm -hmm. I think you see this with all businesses but especially a lot of times with SMBs the CEO or another one of the C-suite or board member will hear of something out there and that will they'll latch onto it and yep. like ransomware with regards to the auto dealership uh, issue, I think it, that, that's happening yep. right now. Yep. So, so suddenly it's like everything else doesn't matter. We have to look at ransomware. It's like, well, what changed from yesterday? Nothing really changed. <laughs> and why are we forgetting? Why are we being reactive? They call that whack-a-mole for that old <laughs> game of whacking moles. It's like, yeah. breathe. How does this fit? First of all, what is the risk? And how does this, what kind of compensating controls do we have in place? Maybe this doesn't affect us. But so when I say breathe, it's it's a physical manifestation mm -hmm. to just stop. You know, the government says mm -hmm. stop, think, connect before you click yeah. on something. It's the same thing here. Just stop and think about it and then figure out the best thing to do from a risk management perspective. So you're going to take a Zen moment and then think through it. Yes, right. yes. The force is with me. <laughs> force is with you, Greg. <laughs> and it is strong. It is strong. <laughs> well, Greg, I tell you what, I uh, it's 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 a thrill to uh, spend time with you. And uh, I can see why you're a frequent guest on TV shows and you're podcasting all the time and uh, and riding up a storm. So. Yeah, you're not only a gentleman and a scholar, but you are extremely entertaining. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, <laughs> I, I love what I do, and I, I think it does show sometimes. And I thoroughly enjoyed being on, so thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Greg. That's our podcast for today. I'm Jeff Edwards for the Safe House Initiative. Thanks for joining us, and remember, be safe, be resilient, and be kind to each other. For more information about the Safe House Initiative, please use your mobile device to scan the QR code on the screen or send us an email at info at safehouseinitiative.org or visit us on our website, safehouseinitiative.org. We look forward to hearing from you.